Good morning, and welcome to live peripheral interventions at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. Today is August 28th, and we have another interesting and challenging case. You can access the cases in the archives at www.peripheralinterventions.org, and you can place your questions at info at peripheralinterventions.org. Dr. Krishnan. Um, you know, um, again, we welcome everybody back to the lab. But again, don't forget to mention that we're we're now on the on the ACC website as well, CardioSource, um, and um, and so therefore, you know, we, they can also see us live at the at the ACC website as well, which is extremely important. And we're also going to archive some of the cases there. Um, you know, uh, first, again, welcome back. We've got a great case. Again, it's a teaching case to really go over some of the salient points regarding um, how to do peripheral intervention safely, effectively, in a time effective and, a, uh, and, a, and, a, and an effective manner for the patient as well as, the, as, well as yourself. Uh, I'd like to introduce my team here. First of all, I've got my interventional uh, endovascular fellow and yours as well, Dr. Karthik Guja. I've got uh, Ray Lascano, our endovascular nurse practitioner, and, uh, and Dr. Mathwal uh, Surabi, our uh, our in interventional, coronary interventional fellow. And our, our nurse, as always, is Elizabeth Holton. And we've got Ricardo, uh, who's our wonderful tech here. So uh, we've got a great case for you. We've got a lot of points. So before we get started uh, with the case, I'm going to have Dr. Guja go over the history uh, and just what type of task classification a little bit for everyone so we can talk about the importance of task classification and, and, um, and our approach to different lesions. Karthik? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. So here we have a 69-year-old female patient with uh, complaints of lifestyle limiting uh, claudication symptoms in both legs. She's uh, on the Crutherford classification, grade two, category four, and she's on medications, uh, pletal and aspirin, and she's in an exercise program for her claudication, but she still has persistent symptoms. The uh, so patient underwent uh, ABI PVR, which showed a result of 0.65 bilaterally. And she had a past medical history significant for uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes uh, type 2. Uh, she's on aspirin, Plavix, Spletal, Metoprolol, um, Amlodipine, at Atorvastatin, Metformin. Uh, she's a non smoker. Uh, she has no alcohol or heavy drug use. Based on the next slide, please. On the physical exam, the pertinent physical findings are she has a Dopplerable TP and PT bilaterally. She has no tissue loss or erythema and the uh, rest of the physical exam is uh, pretty much non-significant. Next slide. She had an arterial Doppler which showed a uh, total occlusion of bilateral mid-SFA uh, with significant uh, calcification. She had a peripheral angiogram performed which shows uh, bilateral mid-SFA chronic total occlusions which were heavily calcified uh, with uh, three vessel runoff distally. She had a successful uh, PTA of the right mid-SFA CTO which was performed on uh, July 29th 2013 with significant relief of symptoms in the right lower extremity on follow-up after two, week, two to three weeks. So here I'm going to go over the task two classification. It has been modified to be a class 2B recently. Uh, so the rationale behind that was uh, based on type C and type C D, uh, lesions, D lesions uh, approach. The type A lesion is basically a single stenosis less than 10 centimeters in length and a single occlusion uh, less than 5 centimeters in length. Type B is multiple lesions, stenosis or occlusions, each less than 5 centimeters. Single stenosis or occlusion less than 15 centimeters, not involving the popliteal area. And then single or multiple lesions in the absence <coughs> of uh, continuous tibial vessels to improve inflow of the distal bypass. Heavily cal uh, calcified occlusions less than 5 centimeters in length and a single popliteal stenosis. Type C, which, uh, type C and D, which become the complex lesions, are uh, type C is multiple stenosis or occlusions totaling more than 15 centimeters with or without heavy recalcification. Recurrent stenosis or occlusions that need treatment after two endovascular interventions. Type D lesions become the most complex ones, which are uh, CTOs of uh, CFA or SFA, more than 20 centimeters, either involving the popliteal artery with heavy calcifications and chronic total occlusions of the popliteal artery involving the trifurcation. So our case here, uh, once uh, Dr. Krishnan is going to go over the anatomy, is uh, going to be kind of between type B and C. 
Uh, and we'll go over that. That's a great presentation, Karthik. And I think it's very important for the audience to really realize, uh, you know, what, why, what, why it's important to actually place these uh, lesions in, in, in a certain category. Uh, you know, task A, task B, task C, task D, because as we know in the past, you know, clearly uh, the, the, the restenosis rates were different with each different uh, task lesions. To, to simply put, task A and B being simpler and therefore having, having much better results endovascularly, C and D being more complex, thereby having more restenosis. But uh, I think with the changing landscape of, of drug looting uh, technology now coming to the endovascular arena or the vascular arena, I think it's very exciting in the sense that it now allows us to take on more challenging lesions but, and give our patients a, a more satisfactory result. Now let me go over the angiographic uh, findings first. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Guja, Dr. Lascano, I mean uh, Ray Lascano uh, went ahead and did, uh, did the angiograms for us. Most important thing I want to just demonstrate is the, is the crossing over. Now I, as those of you who have followed us for many years at, uh, or for a year and a half or two years at peripheralinterventions.org know that how much importance we, we place on technique um, in order to modify the safety. So two things. One is obviously you want to make sure that you, you can visualize your sheath going up and over. Two is using a stiff wire to make sure that um, you, know, you, don't, you don't actually prolapse the sheet across the aorta if you do it on the soft part of the wire. So it's important to focus on the iliac bifurcation when you go up and over uh, so this way you can be very, very effective and safe. Once the sheet's in place, you want to do a complete diagnostic angiography. So you can see here, well, I can tell you from an earlier study that the iliacs really are just calcific, moderate, diffuse disease lesions. The common femorals were not diseased. You can see the SFA. Again, you, uh, you can see a profunda shot here, which is poorly timed, but you can clearly see that the profunda does not have a lesion. Proximal SFA has a significant hemodynamic lesion, and uh, mid-SFA has a, has a chronic total occlusion, which you'll probably see best in this, in this current view here. You can see that the SFA has a mid lesion, and it's, uh, it's about a 100 millimeter lesion, maybe 120 if you include all the, beyond just the stenosis, the occluded area, uh, if you include the stenosis, it's probably around 120 millimeters, and it's, it's going to be heavily calcified, which I'll show you in a second. And then it's very important also to look at the runoff. Uh, you can see here that uh, the runoff here and the trifurcation, as Dr. Guja mentioned, uh, are completely free and have not had any, any um, significant angiographic disease other than a moderate lesion in the anterior tibial. And then it's important to define your lesion all the way down to the foot because, again, you want to leave the patient the way you found them. So remember, even if you fail a CTO, you're not going to make the patient any worse unless you perforate and have a hematoma or something like that. But regardless, if you fail crossing the CTO, as long as you leave your distal runoff the way you found it, you most likely the patient symptoms are not going to worsen. So it's important to always define this. So the worst thing you'd like is to, to be successful with a CTO and then lose some distal vessels and not know what your vessels were prior to. So it's important to follow that discipline. Dr. Now, Christian, is it going to make a difference in your approach whether the patient has three vessel runoff or whether the patient has one vessel? Runoff I, I in think terms I, of I, I mean, uh, Dr. Wally, Jose, I think that's a great, great point. I think it's important also to realize that the, the vessel runoff is not only for seeing what you have before and after, but also seeing whether or not you might need distal protection during the case, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Because, you know, if some of these lesions are so heavily atherosclerotic and calcific that, uh, that, that have a mixture of both plaque and, and, uh, and uh, formed clot that may embolize. So, therefore, you want to make sure that, that you have uh, a, a exact idea of what, what, what the, the distal runoff is prior to, uh, as well as uh, to plan your case. So here, I want to just focus a little bit on our technique of crossing a CTO. And um, you know, I think, I think before I get to the case now, I just want to go over the learning points that, that we would like to impart upon everybody here, OK? Uh, one is, I think, the importance of a diagnostic angiogram, which we went looking at both the inflow and the outflow. OK, that's the first important point. Second important point is to look at, uh, what is it called, the technique of crossing CTOs. So by the time we're done with this, you guys should be able to understand the difference between a subintimal approach and an, an intimal approach or a true luminal approach. I also want you to understand the different devices uh, without using their names for the ACC. I will talk about the devices based on the mechanism of action that are available for you to be able to cross these lesions in an, in an intimal approach or, or true luminal approach. And then we'll talk about re-entry devices, devices that, that, that are able to enter when you are subintimal and you are not able to get back into the lumen. Okay, so I think that's the first point that I want to get across. Second point is, once, once you're, you're through this lesion, 
the, what, what I want to talk about is the options that are available in, in, in TAS CD lesions in terms of what are the theoretical points okay, that you need to keep in mind. Okay? So for instance, what the importance of the above knee popliteal, um, the importance of, of not involving the above knee popliteal in case you fail this intervention so that there's a, a possible bridge, uh, so you don't burn a bridge to further therapy such as a, percutane, uh, such as a uh, vascular bypass graft if the patient needs it. Okay? Thir the third point is also to understand the different tools that are available. The role of stenting, whether it, it's a, it's a, it's for lack of a better word, a bare metal stent or a drug coated stent, okay, or a PTFE covered stent, okay. The role of atherectomy, such as rotational, directional atherectomy in these particular cases, and the use of filters. Then we'll talk a little bit about long-term follow-up with these patients, and we will go over some of the data that's available. Dr. Wiley and I, when I, after I give my recap, Dr. Wiley will undergo, go over some of the data pertinent to this case very, very briefly so that we don't overwhelm you, okay? So I think we've, we've got through the teaching points that we'd like to achieve, and so now I'm gonna talk about the technique of crossing the CTO. So the two things I want everybody out there to understand is, you, what are the things that we can look at angiographically that'll give us an idea regarding whether we can cross the CTO easily or, or quote unquote easily versus it's going to be a very difficult CTO. It's the same exact criteria that I, I believe that, that, that it's applied in the coronaries, I think should be applied in the endovascular space. So right here, you, if, you, if you look at this, Ray, can you freeze it when it comes? You need, you need to take a view, multiple views of the CTO to identify the true stump of the CTO. The same way that you do in the coronary. So this is right now an LAO view. Go next, Ray. And, and this is going to be an RAO view that, uh, that we've done, or more of an AP, a slight RAO with an AP, okay? Now, I want you guys to, to just step it a little bit, Ray. There you go. So you can see here you have two collaterals that come off. Now, we know from the coronary literature and the coronary techniques that we've all been trained on that, that how, how the collaterals can make a difference in terms of the difficulty. But, but it's also important to see whether it's a blind stump or you have some flow in this. Now, now Ray's just gonna, we're just gonna play it real time. Just play it real time, Ray. You can see in this that the SFA, which is right in the center, Profunda is to, is to the right of the, 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 the um, is to the right, right by the bone. You can see here that the SFA occludes. You have a large collateral for uh, coming off the SFA and another collateral coming off. And then you have a stump. And again, Ray's gonna play it again. And you can see there's a stump right below the two collaterals. And I don't know if you actually saw, there was a little bit of dye that went back and forth, showing that that's probably likely to be the, the, the true lumen. There it is, you can see it right there. Now, Dr. Krishna, I guess the challenging uh, uh, thing of this, uh, this case is particularly those collaterals. Uh, when you don't have uh, robust collaterals, it's a little easier to advance your catheters and cross the CCTO. The challenging here is the fact that you have those collaterals and it's very easy to get a wire into them. Exactly. And I think, I think the point here, Dr. Uh, Jose, is that, is that you want to make sure that you look at it in multiple views to identify the stump. Once you identify the stump, Jose, then you know that you're able to now direct. Now, for instance, say this is a blind, a l blind pouch, okay, well, or a complete stump with a large collateral coming off with no beak. Now, that is going to be a more difficult cross than, say, this one, which has a little bit of a beak. So, uh, say you have multiple collaterals coming off, like we've seen so many times in the popliteal in our practice, uh, Jose, where, where you know it becomes even more difficult to cross. So looking at this gives you an idea of what you want to do. So, so can I suggest an algorithm for you of having done a lot of cases on, on how you, we would approach this? So, so when we do have a beak, okay, with multiple collaterals, or we don't have a beak with multiple collaterals, it's still the same algorithm. We use a directional catheter to go down there. So the directional catheters we use are any angle catheters with a vertebral type tip or, or a non-taper angle tip. So at that stage, I mean, you know there are multiple companies out there that produce these and, and, and the users can email us and, uh, and the viewers can email us and we can send them the information. But clearly that would allow you to direct your wire away from the collaterals. Second is working on roadmap so you can see this so you don't do this blindly. So you have a six or seven uh, French uh, uh, catheter and inside of it you have a, uh, a support catheter is what you're telling us. No, actually 
actually what we did was we used a seven French sheet to go up and over. Uh, again, you could use a six or a seven French sheet. And through the seven French sheet, we, we, we actually used a support catheter, mm -hmm. like a vertebral tip catheter to direct the wire or to direct the wire towards this. Okay. So, so now, the point is now, the, the, the choices can be now either a subintimal approach or, or, or a true luminal approach. But Dr. Guja and myself have decided to go for a true luminal approach. So what we decided <coughs> to use was use this uh, catheter, which is a, a catheter produced by one of the companies which actually finds fenestrations. So it's a, it's a, it's a catheter in which we, you rotate the catheter and you will be able to find the true lumen and be able to go through. So Do there are multiple true luminal catheters. One true luminal catheter is the one we're going to use. Uh, the second one is, a, is, a, is another one that actually uses um, OCT technology with, uh, with an actual uh, sort of a, a borrower, for lack of a better word, to get through. Third one is another catheter that uses jaws to push aside the plaque and get through. So, so you, you, and then there's another one which is a rotational wire with a diamond tip that you can use to get through. So, so you're interested in doing an interluminal uh, uh, cross, if, if I, you can. I, you know, you know, that's a great point. I mean, you know, I think that everyone, or, or I think for. At, at the day, to today's day and age, we have so much technology available that gives us a chance to do an interluminal approach. I, I, I would like to do an interluminal approach. Now, why would I like to do an interluminal approach is the next question. Well, to me, if I'm true luminal, I, I would like to do an atherectomy here uh, or even a plain old balloon angioplasty and, and leave it alone without stenting. The reason I don't want to stent at this stage is I don't have the, the drug-coated uh, stents available to me. So therefore, I know that my restenosis rates based on the TAS lead uh, classification of the past with bare metal stents will be high. Second, as you know very well, stents also have a high fracture or can have fractures associated with them, which also make it difficult, although this is not an area necessarily that's prone. It seems to be slightly above the adductor canal, but however, it could also fracture at this stage. Is so, there any data out there that uh, intraluminal crossing is uh, superior to subintimal uh, uh, cross? Any abstract? Any? Well, I know that, that you know? Uh, Karthik did a review of the literature yesterday, and I can tell you that there was one paper that was presented by Dr. Babiev, in, uh, and I'm going to let Karthik just speak to that. Karthik, you want to just talk on that paper? Yeah, so the, it was recently uh, I, I it think it was presented. presented as an abstract in ACC, uh, which basically talks about uh, non-CTOs uh, compared to uh, subintimal and intraluminal approach. Uh, the data clearly shows that the, as long as we are intraluminal, um, the patency of the stents or the uh, the restenosis rates of the stents is much less when compared to when you are subintimal, uh, and, and the p values are pretty significant. Uh, even though the numbers or the number of patients were not uh, large, it was only 104 patients. Uh, how, how many patients? 104 patients. Mm. Yes, and it included about 20 percent of uh, non-CTOs, 30 percent of uh, uh, intraluminal approach and uh, about 30 to 40 percent of uh, subintimal approach. Now, 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 Jose, rather than McCarthy go over the old data, we have the slide set which you will present at the end. So the point is, there was some data that showed that that you know maybe intraluminal approach may be better than a subintimal approach or yeah. or a true luminal approach. So at this stage right here, we know that right now the jury's really truly out on what's the right thing to do. But what I feel is I I'm more directed towards future therapies. I don't have a drug loading balloon in market yet. I know we're in multiple trials at Sinai, but we don't have a drug loading uh, drug uh, loading balloon available. Number two, I know that the drug coated stent is out there, but I don't have that available yet either. So until then, what I would like to do is to do something here that I know is going to reach the nose. Unfortunately, we know that a stent may reach the nose or high percentage of reach the nose, and we know balloon angioplasty may reach the nose. So I'd like to do something and leave her with symptomatic relief like we did on the other leg so that so that uh, if, if it does reach the nose, we can bring her back and give her a more definitive technology. Mm -hmm. Now, before we continue on this path, uh, let me just continue. So we, so we talked about the importance of the an anatomy of the, of the occluded segment. Then we talked about the different ways of crossing, and we've chosen an interluminal approach. Now, this catheter, which is, again, a, a torquing catheter, finds uh, the fenestrations that are available and tries to find a channel interluminally. It, 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 it actually, it's a catheter that you have to clock and counterclock. Now, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to hear the audio. It's audio, audio as well as visual, but, but more audio. When you clock in one direction, if it starts to click over and over again, that means you're actually getting subintimal or in, into, into the wall. So you need to counterclock and try to direct it away. So now we've had some reasonable success with this. And what we did, I don't know if you guys saw on, on, the, on, the, on the film, which I know was up, we used a, conf, uh, we used a stiff 
uh, coronary CTO wire to direct it into that little area away from the collaterals, as you can see, and, and Ray Lascano is giving positive pressure so the catheter doesn't come back. So that's an 014. That's an 014 wire, yes. So what we did now is now we've gone ahead and, and we've moved this device here closer to this, and now what I'm going to do is Ray's going to let go, and I'm just going to clock it and counterclock it. Clock, counterclock, clock, counterclock. Let's see how it does. So it's starting to move a little bit, as you see. It is. Okay. It's very calcific lesion, so so the other thing you can do is I'm gonna have oh sorry. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have Karthik just move the wire down a little bit. It's okay, just move the wire a little bit, Karthik, forward, but don't come out. Okay, he's gonna stop right there. And that, that's gonna give me a little bit more support here. So allow me to, fade, right? to move. Unfortunately it's not going. So what I do at this stage usually is I pull it back and then I do it again with a little bit of momentum and hopefully it, it pops through and you can see it did that. You see that? So you're rotating and pushing. I'm not pushing exactly, I'm just giving some positive pressure. Okay. See, the, the key here is you can't push. See, I, I, th I think if you push, what happens is, see, the wire has to come down. Mm -hmm. Okay, Okay. let's do a road map here, guys, one second. So you don't want to push. Again, like I said, it's one of the, uh, drop the mag a little. I, th I think if you push, what happens is you, you tend to perf, inject. So we're going to give a little roadmap. Like I said, I want everybody to use roadmap more and more in their practice to be able to tell you. And actually, we're, we're quite far away from our, our true lumen here. So we're going to just continue to torque and follow the calcific path like it's doing right there. See how it jump forward? Mm -hmm. I don't want you to worry about that. It's not that I'm pushing. It's just trying to find the fenestrations. So you know. So it develops torque. It develops torque, exactly. And it just finds fenestrations. Okay, and now it seems to be moving very nicely, right, which is fine. And, and notice Dr. Guja is just keeping uh, the wire closely to this. If you can focus on my hands a little, guys, so they can see what I'm doing, which is just, you know, very gentle. You know, I've got really very minimal pressure here. I'm just very gently moving forward. And see, now I'm not happy with that one, so I'm going to stop here. I'm going to come off road map. So I use two things as my clues. One is I use my angiographic clues. And the second is <coughs> I use my, my uh, calcific clues. So now we're going to go ahead, again, go, uh-huh, inject. So we're going to go ahead again and use a uh, road map, which is going to tell us where we are. And you can see it's actually in a reasonable path. I wouldn't say it's in a great path. It seems to be a little subminimal to me. But again, again, like I said, what we're just trying to do is just make a channel down here. And see there? See how it moved away? So I'm going to pull it back, and I'm going to try to torque in the other direction. And again, it seems to be moving away. Maybe it'll come back. I don't know. It doesn't seem so like it's going to. So the device can go subintimal as it well. It can right? go subintimal. Unfortunately, you're right. It can. It's not a. It's not a hundred percent shot here that it's going to go luminal or intraluminal or whatever. No, we seem to be off here. But I'm just going to try to get it down to the distal cap, which seems to be right it's around. It's turning in now. Well, it's trying. Like I said, it just tries. You know, I'm not. I mean, remember, we're looking at a 3D. View, uh, 2D view of a 3D picture. So the whole point is just try to get it close enough for us to use one of our, uh, our, our, our CTO devices or our crossing devices to get through. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, advance the wire a little bit. And then what I'm going to do is try to pull back and redirect with the wire because I know I'm away. So I'm going to pull back and then I'm going to try to use the wire to try to cross. Because you know this is also a reasonable approach to try to use the wire. And unfortunately, we're clearly not there. So, I'm so you're a different plane, right? Yep, I'm definitely in a different plane. So we're, going to, we're probably going to have to use an intraluminal device here or a, or a re-entry device, which is fine. Like I said, we just want to try to do demonstrate different techniques. So Prakash, if you had to use a uh, re-entry device, any preference, uh, uh, ultrasound well, guided or think I think in today's day and age, Dr. Wiley, I think um, when you have ultrasound guidance, I think it helps you so much to really see which way you can go. So I think ultrasound guidance may not be a bad thing. So and I, think, I think since the Viance device did fail, um, I think what we're going to do now is just go with our usual uh, techniques to try to get through. Now, 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 obviously, we've created a plane that's subminimal, right? And so now we're going to try to go back with... Uh, with a luminal approach or a subminimal approach, and which is now again going to change our strategy. 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Dr. Gujo walk this device out. So are you going to use a 014 uh, system or are you going to <coughs> use a 035 system uh, <coughs> subintimally? Or I think or? it's a great point. Now what I've since this failed, and you know, remember that you're now you're asking a lot of this device. It's a very calcific SFA, so you're asking a lot of this device. So what we're going to now do is we're going to go with an 035 system, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for this curved catheter, which we talked about, which again is just a directional catheter. So this directional catheter is going to allow us to get in. And I think, you know, this is real world. This is what everybody goes through. But the whole point is trying to figure out an algorithm which really works well for you. So, so, I, so two important things I want to point out. I did not take the wire too distal to the distal rock re reconstitution zone, right? So, so I did not go very, very, very far across the distal reconstitution zone. Come off roadmap here, guys. So are you compelled to use now hydrophilic wire or? or well, I, I am going to see how this feels, OK? And, and, it's, and again, this is a field thing. So I'm going to have uh, uh, them give me a little dye. I want to get back to the cap. Little dye, guys. Don't let the wire go. Uh -huh, that's fine. So I'm just going to get back to the cap, right? So the cap is right here. So I'm very comfortable with this area here. See, so I'm going to go ahead and just get through this. So I'm OK with up to this area here. I'm going to go ahead and fly through this. A Little bit of positive pressure, right? Now I'm going to go with a, uh, we're going to try, let me just try a little bit with this wire, see how this behaves. Get an 035 wire here, guys. <coughs> right? So I'm going to see how this feels. Now this definitely does not, well now look, I actually have the ability to torque. So I can actually try to find different planes. Obviously that's not it. You know, so, so the point here is try to find different planes to be able to advance this through in a nice manner. There we go, that's a lot better, come down now. So now let me see here whether I can. You nope. see the tram track there from the calcifications. Exactly, that's exactly what I'm trying to use this for. So I'm okay up to here, so I'm gonna take this catheter down. And again, that's a great point, Dr. Wiley. You wanna use whatever, whatever advantage that you have. Obviously calcifications are a disadvantage, but, but if you have an advantage to, to use the tram track, why not? Okay, guys, give me the uh, wire now. So now we're going to go with an 035 glide wire, which is, again, the standard way that was always been taught to us. So we're going to go with an 035 glide. Probably the calcification makes it much more difficult to cross. And again, now this is starting to change our, our thought process as to how we're going to treat. So now, obviously, I'm being very aggressive with this wire. You can see there's a lot of, uh, what is it called, uh, you know, it's not extravasation, but AV fistulas that we've created. So which not, is okay. Not That's to panic with that stuff. So now I'm going to form the C-loop, right? Which is now I'm going to try to just break through with the C-loop, which I think is the simplest way to do it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Karthik go ahead and give me a roadmap to see where the distal reconstitution zone is. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So he's going to give me the little roadmap here for us. We're going to find the reconstitution zone right there. So it's important to now keep now two theoretical advantages here of the C loop is that you're actually going to cut through through the plaque right all the way down, and what you'd like to do is oh sorry Ray what you'd like to do is advance the catheter and reduce your loop. So we always teach every everybody that we meet here that what you want to do is try to reduce the length of your loop and reduce where you enter. Are you in? It looks, uh, pretty, it looks close. pretty It looks pretty good, but again, this is the important part that I want everybody to understand. I do not want to extend this past that next collateral. The reason is I know that my treatable segment is up to that collateral. Remember we talked about the length of the lesion, the calcified segment, to exactly where we want to treat. And we wanted to avoid treatment of the above knee pop. The tendency that we see for a lot of zealous interventionalists is to go ahead and dissect all the way down into the popliteal and have to put a stent all the way into the above knee popliteal, which I don't think is the right thing to do, especially with the technologies that we have available. So right here now, we may be in, so rather than, I, you know, I don't know whether I would lose this loop, so what I will do is I'll gently advance my catheter, okay, and I'm going to pull the loop out here, okay? And I'm going to see how it goes, because I know if I'm not in, I can clearly use other technologies to get in. And you can see now I'm through. Very, very simply, we're through. Okay. So now the, the point I'm trying to say is that it's the concept. It's not, the, it's not difficult to do. If you keep aggressively advancing this wire, 
you will get through. I guarantee you. There's no science. I'm no better than anyone else. No one, you know, it's we're all the same. But the point is to understand the theory on what we're trying to accomplish. You want to limit the amount of area that you are going to treat to the diseased area that you're going to treat. If you go ahead and advance it into the pop and you leave a dissection, it's going to be normal, I guess, uh, tendency to want to go ahead and stent that. So you'd like to avoid that <clears throat> by not by keeping being very cognizant of where you're going to treat. So that's the, I knew I was going to treat up to here because you can see there seems to be a significant stenosis of the SFA here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and we're go, what we, we had planned on multiple different things here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this out. I'm going to go ahead and put an 014 wire in, uh, either either a stiff support wire in. Okay. So Prakash, is it going to change now your approach mm -hmm. uh, now that not, you did not necessarily, Dr. Wally? I know that uh, a chronic total occlusion uh, normally, when when you take a subintival approach, people don't uh, sometimes do not want to do atherectomy or or uh, debridement of this vessel. But here we've become, you know, we've done quite a few of them. We've become quite good at it. And so what we do here is we go ahead. We do do this, but how I will do it is by doing IVUS. When I, when I when I perform intravascular ultrasound, it'll give me an idea of where I am, and I'll correlate that with both intravascular ultrasound as well as angiographic uh, guidance to do it. So, Prakash, so you did, uh, you perhaps do an intravascular ultrasound, and you see the where the lumen is located and where the plaque is. Uh, would that make a difference with the atherectomy device that you will use, whether it's going to be a directional atherectomy catheter or a rotational or orbital atherectomy? I think, or I it think doesn't. I think that's a great, great question, though, Jose. I got to tell you why. I think when you are subintimal, it really, really makes you to choose a directional catheter versus a rotational catheter. I know that the uh, the rotational catheters, especially the one uh, that that aspirates, uh, is actually one that that, that clearly uh, doesn't that doesn't affect um, unhealthy tissue or healthy tissue. So theoretically, yeah, you could try it, but I think we are at least are very uncomfortable with trying that particular one, you're panning, we're trying that particular one in these particular lesions. Okay, off roadmap in these regions. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to show me down now. Just want to put my, so what I've decided to do, since I may atherectomize this, I'm just going to go ahead and put a filter at this level, right? Show me above, guys. I have a lot of trouble pushing through this here for whatever reason. Again, the calcific spicules are not helping. Wow, give me a little dye. Might have to dilate that lesion a little more than we think. See, there's a little piece of calcium right there that's not allowing me through, Dr. Wally. You see that? Yep. So it's really affecting my ability to get through. So, yeah. So I think what I'm going to do here is uh, you just use the filter. Uh, I was going to demonstrate an easy way of, uh, of dropping the, the filter device in, but I'm going to use it the way it was meant. Can you prep the filter? Are you going to try to push with another catheter? No, or? no, I'm just going to deploy the filter first. Uh, I'm going to deploy the filter here. So what we're going to do is we normally introduce the filter through this, this uh, four French catheter. Obviously, there's not a coronary, so we were not going to send it through the way it was meant to, but now this is actually a good opportunity to demonstrate how it is. So you can see Les uh, Ray Lascano is giving me the filter. The advantage of this particular filter system, there's multiple systems available. First of all, this particular system is FDA approved uh, for the use in the periphery, has, has, has been approved for this indication. So the second advantage of this particular system is that the wire, you can use your wire of your choice to get across the lesion, obviously which is more pertinent in the coronary than in the peripheral. So you can see here that, uh, that Dr. Guja is, is opening up the, the what we call as the, the port, and it's not going through. Is that it? Nope. Sorry. There it is. So the wire just came out. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy this system. Rail. Good. And then let's get the IVUS ready, Serby. So what we're going to do is we're going to go all the way down. I'm going to deploy the system at the level of the popliteal to protect us against dis dislambulization. So the catheter didn't go through the deletion. You think the IVUS will? Oh, definitely. I think I think uh, the, compared to a four French catheter, the new Ivis, well, the you know, there are two different companies. I don't want to talk about the companies, <coughs> but the two catheters, I think, would easily traverse this lesion uh, without anything. Now, that's a great question. If you cannot traverse with the Ivis, there's nothing wrong with doing a simple balloon angioplasty with a smaller vessel, with a, with a smaller well, lesion, did or a small size balloon, and then and then go ahead and advance it. So here we go ahead. We put our filter distally. 
And now what we're going to do is we're going to advance the filter. Now, how did we size the filter? We, be, being the SFA Papatil, we just sized it to the largest uh, filter that they have. It's a seven millimeter filter, um, and I think that's pretty reasonable with every particular uh, filter device that's available in the market. So we're just pushing it down there, and then when we go ahead and deploy it here, you can see that the filter is deployed right there, which is fine. I'm gonna walk this device out and we'll talk about recapturing it later. Now, now that we're done with this, we're gonna do IVIS. Now, now I, don't wanna, I don't wanna be a proponent and tell everybody, oh, you have to do an intravascular ultrasound in order to be able to do this or that. Actually, these come out a little bit more. Um, I, I'm just doing it for teaching purposes. I wanna teach the theory of, uh, of this particular lesion, how we crossed it, and we can learn um, in terms of how it looks by intravascular ultrasound, and then decide on therapies. Now, it, it could be very simple that you, you could say to me, hey, you're subminimal, just stent it. And I think at the end, you may be right. But, but I really want to know exactly how this looks so I can make up my mind. I'm actually pretty convinced that in the beginning part of it, we were luminal, and then right around the end of it is when we went subintimal. The other thing to remember is always work on a longer system. Currently, as you guys know, the, uh, the peripheral systems do not come in, 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 uh, in, um, in, one eight, uh, in monorail uh, systems, they're all over the wire. So it's very important that, like, not to break this filter wire, which, which has the ability for it to be broken. Show me above, guys. So you definitely don't want to do it. Okay, let's set up a pullback for the IVIS. Okay, so yeah. you think that this is intimal calcification or medial calcification or, or? Hold on, Jose, I'm gonna just show you now. I'm gonna go all the way down, go down. Little die, guys, show me the distal reconstitution. <coughs> Little die. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go across this. The, this is the, seems to be the real problem here. You see that? See that, Jose? I'm not able to yep. break through that even with the IVUS. Look at that, mm. wow. All right, so we're gonna start here because we know at this level we were okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and play IVUS. I want, I, want, I, want, I want the IVUS to be played. I'm gonna do a manual pullback for sake of time. Ready? Okay, well, well, recording? It's, it's clearly intimal calcification. Recording? It's not recording. So we're gonna record, here is live now. And now we're gonna record, there it is. So I'm just gonna pull it back. So, so far we know we're luminal here, okay? Even here, you can clearly see, Jose, all the layers, all the structures. You can see here, till luminal, all luminal. Mm -hmm. There we have a little bit of a dissection, you see that flat there, not horrible. That's the, the, now let me see where we are probably right around that, that collateral that we just saw. Yep. And you can see here that we're pretty much luminal, Jose. Yeah, and I think it's all uh, intimal calcification rather than medial calcification. Now, I think, which, I think this is a phenomenal teaching IVUS. I'll tell you why. Look at the lack of plaque. I mean, can you guys see? I mean, it's basically com compressive calcific lesion that's actually causing the occlusion. And there's a little bit of plaque. Now you see that the, the uh, IVIS, how that looks? That could be either plaque or, in my opinion, thrombus. I know IVIS is not great for looking at thrombus, but in that, at, at that one area, it's very suspicious that it could either be plaque or thrombus. Here you have some plaque interluminally, you can see here. And again, you can see you have a, some plaque versus thrombus up at this area. So show me above, guys, a little die here so the audience can see where we are, a little die. Okay. So you can see we're right in the middle of this, okay? Okay. So, so where are you now? We're actually, we're not, we're not at the true, true, uh, uh, give me a little, some more die, please. So you are at the reconstitution portion or, or back? Not yet, we're still in the, le in the lesion. Okay. So you can see here now it's oh, full I of, see. you see it's now it's full of plaque. And you see we're still luminal. We're still luminal, Dr. Wiley, with plenty of plaque. You see that? Mm-hmm. Uh, does everybody agree with me or am I? Uh, no, 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 I, I, I agree. Okay, I just want to make sure. I mean, I don't have an audience to respond, so I need, I need, I need you guys to respond. So here, I think, again, again, I'm very convinced we're within the lumen, and you can see extensive compressive calcification of the vessel wall, as you can see here, coming all the way back, and I think this is where we're gonna break into the, the true lumen again. You see that? There's, there's the dye coming through. So now you see that even though we use the subminimal approach, quote unquote, by IVIS, we're certainly within the lumen. So now I'm gonna go ahead and do uh, a, a atherectomy. 
uh, especially of the proximal area, because I think I have significant plaque in the proximal area. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do an anthrectomy here. So I think we've defined that you're into luminal. Will that make a difference between the type of anthrectomy device you're going to use? We said that if you were subentimal and you you Great were question. Precluded to use say uh, directional atherectomy, would that change at this time? I, actually, that's a great point. You're absolutely right. I think at this point you can use any atherectomy device as uh, you want. The advantages of directional atherectomy here are obviously a larger lumen that I can get and leave with the standalone treatment. I think I think if I have a rotational atherectomy, the current devices that are available are not are not going to give me an acceptable lumen uh, at this stage. So therefore, with the directional atherectomy, I'm going to go ahead and be able to get possibly a standalone result. Now that I'm atherectomizing, as you know very well, Dr. Wiley, we have an algorithm here that we're in the process of uh, compiling our data to hopefully submit to publication uh, in, that, in that where we use atherectomy and where we use the distal protection. Now this is our algorithm, our personal algorithm. We do not have any data to support this at this time, but it would make intuitive sense. The intuitive sense that it would make is that, okay, when you have this much plaque burden in an occlusion such as this, you know that, that you, are, you have the tendency to have both plaque and thrombus on this particular lesion. So therefore, what we do here is we go ahead and use distal protection. Now, I'm going to show you what our technique of atherectomy in these lesions. So you're so, using the filter because of the plaque burden or the calcification or both? I, th I think we're using the filter burden for both. So you can see here the device is barely slipping by that distal lesion, not really. So, we're, we're, so which is actually going to do something for me, which I think is very good. What I, I do not want to cut that distal aspect. Do you remember the beginning of the IVUS? The beginning of the IVUS actually showed external calcification with minimal plaque. The, the, the actual occlusion had all the plaque with some external calcification. So therefore now it clearly will tell me that my atherectomy device will, new, will do really nothing at that distal portion where it was stenotic and like I said we were going to treat it, but clearly you don't need to atherectomize that area. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get up to the part, I have, I, I have my bony landmarks come up. I know that because that little dot is exactly where I want to start. Little die guys just to show everybody. So you can see here. That, that, that'll be kind of where the, the, uh, the, the, see the vessel starts right about here. So I'm going to start in this plane on. So I, the other important point I want to make is how we push the atherectomy device through once. Having pushed it through once, we know it's not going to stagnate. And clearly, it's going to be able to go, OK? So off. So we're going to pack on, on. So we're going to try to make a quote unquote four quadrant cut. There are newer atherectomy catheters coming out uh, off, on. There are newer atherectomy <coughs> catheters coming out which has guidance via, via whether it's IVUS or not, off. They have guidance by uh, actual imaging. Show me above. So I'm going to go ahead again to the reconstitution zone. Now what I generally like to do, Dr. Wiley, is to, is to, is to make two polar opposite cuts, on. and then take a picture. So you're planning on doing two cuts or four I cuts? I may do or? more than two, but I want to show you the technique of what we do very well here. Pack, on, which is do two cuts and then take a picture. Off, okay? So I'm, I'm going to pull it back now. Then I'm going to take a nice picture. So Prakash, since you're using a directional atherectomy, are you comfortable with the definitive LE data? Okay, Cine. For this type of case? Well, I think, look at that. Okay, good. So we have some AV fistulas. Okay, which is fine. I'm not concerned at all about that. Now, am I comfortable with the definitive LE data? I think the definitive data uh, being core lab adjudicated gives me some confidence that, <laughs> that this device works. Now, as you know, Dr. Wiley, we've been, at least I've been a proponent of atherectomy versus uh, other modalities of therapy, basically because of the frustration that we've had with the, the high incidence of restenosis and also possibly burning the bridge to future therapies. With atherectomy, obviously, definitive LE clearly showed that, that, it, that it works, that, that, it, that, it, that it is durable, and that is very comparable. And one of the slides that you have actually compares it to all the different uh, modalities that are available. And we'll discuss that in a second. Now I want to take one more picture. Inject, guys. That's enough. 
So you see here, the distal reconstitution zone is where we have the dissection plane. So this is the area where we're gonna have to either balloon or stent. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna stop here. And I'll tell you why I'm gonna stop here. I know that my anthrectomy catheter would not cross distal to that. I also know by intravascular ultrasound that I do not have any plaque there to excise. So what I'm gonna do here is do, do a balloon angioplasty with an undersized balloon. What size balloon did you ask four, for? Four we asked a four millimeter by 80. We probably need longer than 80. Do we have longer than 80, guys? Give me 120 if we have it. 40120. We need a 40120 balloon. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna balloon it now with a, just to undersize it and see how it looks. Now, why am I undersizing this balloon? Well, for two reasons. I think, first of all, the, these lesions are prone, prone to, obviously, dissection because of the level of calcification. And two is, I'd like to limit my stenting. If, if, if Sorby can go C minus, the, the proximal area where we atherectomize is quite acceptable, okay? Although the, there is a lesion there, the distal area clearly needs to be dilated. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna more size the balloon to the, to the distal area, open it up there, <coughs> and, then, and then use prolonged serial balloon inflammation, inflations, 4-0 up. And now since I have intravascular ultrasound, I can ask my te uh, the Pablo to go ahead and measure the largest diameter of that vessel, uh, both distally where we started and proximally, Pablo, and let me know what size is the vessel. And she, he's actually done that. So we know that we have a 5-0 vessel, as you can see there. So since we have a 5-0 vessel, I'm just gonna go ahead and advance the balloon as they rail me. So since we have a 5-0 vessel, we're gonna go ahead and use a 4-0 balloon at this stage, and then, and then go ahead and decide. Show me the filter, guys. The other thing you always wanna be cognizant of your filter, which is in perfect position. Show me above. That's fine, you can watch it there. You can watch it there till I come. That's perfect right there, right there's perfect. So we're gonna just come down with the balloon. Am I across? Yeah, yeah. Okay, pull it back, right there. Okay, let's balloon this. So you know that we're, we're undersized with this balloon, 4-0, in a 5-0 vessel. And again, it's again, to, it, there's a reason for that madness, is to really try to minimize uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the need for stenting. We're gonna have to pull this back. Mm -hmm. Go up. So Prakash, this is more of a rhetorical question. Uh, if you had available uh, drug-eluting balloon, drug-eluting stents, and all the atherectomy devices that you've been talking about, which would have been your choice? Ah, I mean, first, first of all, I think, I think that's a great question. I think drug-eluting balloon is gonna need uh, some sort of vessel prep in this particular lesion. So wh whether you decide to pre-dilate this vessel or, 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 or not pre-dilate this vessel but with a balloon, you're gonna have to pre-dilate with an undersized balloon. Once you do an undersized balloon, then you're gonna have to use a drug loading balloon. We know the data from Italy and, and Europe shows that calcific lesions may, may have some slightly less uh, you know, acceptable outcomes with drug loading balloons. So the question comes up about vessel prep. We know that one of the, uh, one of the companies has performed a atherectomy followed by drug loading balloon trial, and we're very excited uh, to, to hear the data, which I hope we presented at TZT this year. So I think to answer that question just up front is very difficult, Dr. Wiley. I think if, if we I think it is going to probably pan out into two. One that, hey, you know, do we need vessel prep in this particular lesion because of calcification, excessive plaque burden, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think plaque is gonna make a difference. I think calcium is. So I think if you have calcium, you may end up needing vessel prep, and that may be the atherectomy devices. You may or may not. Again, I wanna say it's a may or may not. So I think in this particular lesion, this is probably the most difficult lesion to treat and get an acceptable result. So I would say in the future, the jury's still out on whether vessel prep is going to be important in these lesions. Do you we feel uncomfortable with the uh, drug eluding stent data from the Silver PTX? Uh, I think I think the data is very impressive. You know, the, their three-year data was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and you know that you know the data looks well, quite impressive. Uh, you know, but it's important to remember that the, the, it was talked about was TLR rates, which I think is very important and clinically significant for our patients. So I, I think that yeah, I would be very comfortable. But the lesion length studied was a lot less than this. Uh, obviously, the registry data has longer lesions studied, which, but which again <coughs> provides some encouragement for us to be able to use that. But again, that's what I mean by an exciting point in our careers where we have all this ab availability that's going to be, that's actually knocking on our doorstep as we speak. Okay, we're up for a minute now? Two minutes now. So we're going to go down with this balloon. Okay, let's uh, walk it back a little bit. Let it come down first. 
So it's important, again, to let the balloon come down and then walk it back slowly, uh, so which is what we're going to do. So we used a 4014 uh, 4 balloon since we're working on an 014 system. And again, the company and the product producer is not important. The point is that the type of product that we're using is an 014 balloon. Now Dr. Guj is going to pu pull it back, and we know the collateral is above that dark stain, a little higher. Prakash, would you have considered uh, PTFE covers higher. Uh, stent? Higher. higher. I think that's a great question. Okay, go up here. I think, I think a PTFE data in this particular lesion subset, that, as you know, and you're going to present it, you have four, uh, four or five studies that have actually been performed in, in this subset with TAS C and D lesions. So, so in this particular subset, a PTFE uh, is not unreasonable. My, my concern with a PTFE covered stent in this particular area is that I would probably lose those uh, collaterals that were patent from the SFA to the SFA, uh, keeping, keeping the, uh, the lesion open. Um, again, the patient has three vessel runoff, and as you know, our algorithm here at Mount Sinai is quite simple. We use uh, runoff as a criteria for PTFE. We do not use PTFE covered grafts in single vessel runoff, uh, especially in the face of multiple collaterals. So yeah, but about to answer your question, yeah, that's a very viable option. My hope here, is to do balloon angioplasty with atherectomy and lever with balloon angioplasty and atherectomy. So that would be my ultimate goal, and uh, you know, we're just leaving this balloon up. I know we're, ru we're running close to time, but uh, I just want to spend a little time on, on, on our algorithmic approach while the balloon stays up. So again, I wanted everybody to now go through simply. One, we, we talked about the importance of the anatomical, uh, of the proximal stump. Two, we talked about the technique of crossing. We demonstrated both intraluminal crossing, which failed in this case, and quote unquote subintimal technique, which was with, with the glide, uh, with, with, with the hydrophilic wire and the directional catheter. Three, once we were done, we used the intravascular ultrasound to confirm whether we were luminal or intraluminal, <coughs> or, or luminal or subintimal. And clearly, you saw throughout the, most of the the the, uh, the uh, IVUS, we were we were intraluminal versus subintimal. And then four, we did atherectomy, directional atherectomy. Uh, and again, you could have done rotational or directional atherectomy. Five, we talked about the use of filter and why we use the filter. And six, now we're doing prolonged balloon inflation. Now, I just want to just present one, one more thing, is the re-entry devices. If you were not able to enter uh, at, the, at the level of the distal uh, occlus occluded segment, then you could use multiple re-entry devices. They have ones with all, all employ a needle type technology to get in. One, one is, uh, uh, uses a balloon to be able to direct it, and the other uses intravascular ultrasound to be able to direct it. So, oh gosh, I know we're crushed for time, but I have two questions here. Uh, one of them relates to the use of laser in this particular case. Uh -huh. uh, would you have considered that? And I have another question of uh, the use of cryoplasty. Would you have considered that? Um, that's, a, that that's actually a great question. Um, the, as, as Dr. Guja is going to walk this out watching the filter, uh, I can talk to you about laser. I mean, laser Laser, again, is an extremely effective therapy uh, in, 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 these, in these lesions. The problem is, is with heavily calcified lesions, uh, you know, the use of laser, is, is you can definitely use it, but I don't, I don't necessarily think it's as effective as, as other devices in terms of atherectomy. The second point with laser is obviously the luminal gain with, with just laser is not going to be as high as it is with atherectomy, but if you're planning on ballooning as you did here, then, then it may not be a, a bad choice at all, you know, in this particular case. So you can clearly go ahead and do laser followed by balloon. If As thrombus would have been uh, a, pr a consideration, uh, would you have considered laser? Uh, you know, if it was thrombus, honestly, Jose, as you know, the thrombotic burden is so high um, if it was an acute thrombotic lesion that you and I generally use lytic catheters uh, followed by, you know, bringing the patient back. Uh, you know, laser, again, is good in thrombus as, in, as is uh, the rotational aspirational atherectomy device. But I think uh, clearly, you know, whether it's a rheolytic thrombectomy and using, uh, uh, what is it called, power pulse spray uh, with an indwelling catheter, go ahead, take a picture, guys, versus, uh, uh, you know, do using laser or the other one, I think it's either one of those are the choices. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, cryoplasty, which whoever asked that question is a great question, there is the COBRA trial, which, which looked at TAS-C and D lesions, okay? So the, the, the COBRA trial clearly looked at TAS-C and D, and I, I, think, I think COBRA 
uh, showed that, that there was a favorable uh, effect of uh, cryoplasty versus balloon angioplasty. So, you know, so clearly here, I think you can definitely say that, yes, cryoplasty is a possible, possible, uh, you know, option, a viable option. So I, I think that, uh, you know, I think there's no right or wrong answer, I think, at this stage. Again, I want, I want to demonstrate, proximally, I'm extremely happy. You know, approximately the total occlusion is done, right? You've got, you've, got, you've got that nice flow. You've got a little bit of a tear of the vessel there, and you can see the dissection plane. And then distally, go plus, guys. Distally, you can see here that you have a lesion at the distal edge. So now, it's, it's not a flow-limiting dissection. Right. So that's what I'm going to do, Jose. I'm going to ask for a 5 okay? of 60, 80 balloon, 5080 balloon now. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna balloon the proximal segment, I'm just gonna balloon the distal segment, and then I'm gonna go ahead and see. So we're gonna go ahead now, balloon the distal segment. So while they get the balloon ready, uh, you know, th th that's a great point that you bring up, Dr. Wiley. I think a lot of our colleagues and even us, uh, you know, sometimes get very, very uh, worried about the angiographic appearance of these lesions. Unless you have a significant flow-limiting dissection, as you know, the standard of care currently is to just go ahead and leave it and then, and then go ahead and not worry about how it looks, but actually look at the, at the standard of, uh, look at the flow in the vessel. Now, if you look at both the drug eluting trials that were just completed, both uh, the impact SFA as well as Levant, <coughs> they both had extremely strict uh, um, stenting criteria, which I think is very, very uh, obvious in a, in a trial that's looking at balloon versus balloon. Uh, however, their criteria actually made a lot of sense to me, which is they actually look for a gradient across the lesion if you felt the dissection was, was, uh, was something that you wanted to treat. So here, <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this balloon down, which is a 5 and they're going to rail me. So you can see I'm coming down with a 5 and I'm going to expand it with a prolonged balloon inflation. Okay, a little die, guys? No, a little lower, I gotta go. Show me lower. You know, I'm anxious to see if that filter has anything in it. L little die, please. Okay, that's perfect. Rail, please. Yeah. Okay, let's go up here, guys. So now we're gonna go up with the 5 -0 balloon. Prakash, are we going to have time to see if there's anything in the filter? I think we are. I mean, uh, I mean, you can ask the AV people. I think we definitely have some extra time if we need it. Keep going up, please. I'm particularly anxious to see if there's anything in there. Keep going up. Go to 10. Mm -hmm. okay. So now you see that we've inflated this. And, and, you know, the other thing also is the use of bare metal stenting, Jose. I think one of the things we need to talk about is the choice of stents. Obviously, you can use the simple open cell, closed cell design, but there's also the, 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 slotted, uh, the slotted cell design, mm -hmm. which in these calcific lesions may be enough to give you enough radial strength to keep it open. Obviously, the problem with the slotted cell design stent is that, that sometimes deployment may be a challenge, but clearly here also it, it can work very, very well. So you see here now, we're gonna leave this balloon up. We've expanded it nicely. I'm gonna leave this up for a little bit. And I, my tendency here, Dr. Wiley, is not to stent this unless I really feel, you know, and you know, a lot of people may say, hey, you know, Prakash, you should have stented it. But my tendency here is not to stent it unless I have a, a horrible flow limitation that I'm concerned about. I think we've achieved a great result. And, and again, it's important to look back on our goals of therapy. So Prakash, are, are you gonna have, or are you performing a uh, short, or uh, short balloon balloon inflation or prolonged balloon inflation doesn't well, make any difference uh, well I think I think we know the prolonged balloon may help in tacking up some of the dissections uh, you know however what we're doing here normally we, pr we inflate about five minutes at a time but here we're doing about two minutes we're live but I don't really know whether there's any difference that's really made we're just trying to expand this lesion tack it up a little bit we are going to expect a little bit of recoil so therefore you know we're, we're, we're gonna have to deal with that in different ways but what I was trying to get get, get to you before was what are my goals of therapy when I started 
with this. My goals of therapy here were, was not critical limb, was not healing the lesion, was not rest pain. My critical limb was, was a Rutherford uh, claudication category that I was treating. So clearly in the, I know that I improved their opposite leg. I know I will improve this leg. I do know regardless of the mode of therapy that I have currently available to me right now, my restenosis rates are gonna be high. I do know that, that, that there are new technologies that are available in the future that, that will definitely help me in order to be able to help this lady more so I don't want to burn a bridge. So at this stage, if I can leave her with just a, a atherectomy with a plain old balloon angioplasty without losing any of my distal vessels, I think I've done her a great service. We have a great relationship with all our patients here at Sinai, and I can tell you that we, we, we will talk to her about the fact that there is a possibility that this will reach an ocean and that she may need different therapy. I think it's also important for all of our operators out there who are watching, our caregivers, that they have to discuss that with the patient. You know, we do not have the holy grail, obviously, in anything that we do in medicine, but especially in vascular disease, so it's important for us to talk to them and let them know why you did what. Most patients equate stenting with, uh, with coronary stenting, which we know is extremely effective in terms of restenosis rates. So they always say, why didn't I get a stent? So I think it's important to sit there and explain to them that in the, in the endovascular space, stenting, at least with bare metal or with slotted design stents, have been associated with some restenosis rates that, that, that we have newer technology on its way. So that's extremely important. Prakash, a surgeon uh, would, would have asked, why not a FEMPOP bypass? Uh -huh. I think that's a phenomenal question. I think, I think a FEMPOP bypass obviously is a great procedure. I think the patency rates with an above knee vein are absolutely phenomenal, especially five years. And I think it's a very reasonable choice. The, the, the thing is she's a claudicant, uh, she's not critical limb. And I think I would most, most endovascular or vascular people at this stage would do an endovascular first therapy. And I think that's an important point you bring up, why you don't want to involve the above knee pop. You're not out yet. You, 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 you don't want to involve the above knee pop because clearly that is your target zone which will give her the absolute best result with a fempop bypass whether it's ptfe or it's vein second thing is most of our patients who, who who are coming to us with advanced vascular disease have concomitant disease have had prior surgeries etc cetera, etc cetera, in the past especially for their heart so they may not have harvestable vein available so now we'll take a shot here ready Don't move, hon. Things are good. We're just taking a look here. That looks pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to look. I mean, I, I just want to make sure we don't have too much flow limitation. I want to look at in multiple angles here. There's another important thing, guys. Try to look at orthogonal um, um, angles of your lesions to make sure you see it in different angles, right? We know we were right about here to here. Ready? So, because you might be surprised what you see when you just angulate a little bit. So you see, you see the ledge there that we saw? Mm -hmm. So it looks, you know, you have a lumen, but clearly you have disease. You know, you've preserved your collateral, which is fine. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go this side. And I think this is the, this is the controversial thing here, Dr. Wally. I mean, people would say, why not stent this? You know, why not stent the distal aspect? And I think, you know, honestly, it's a judgment thing, and I, I don't really believe there's a right or a wrong. You know, until we get, see, you have, you have wonderful flow. You preserved your collaterals. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thrilled to stop here unless you feel. You know, I agree with you. You know, I'm, I do not encourage the oculostenotic uh, reflex of uh, trying to make the, the vessel uh, uh, pretty is making it functional. And uh, I think that there's no evidence of uh, flow limitation at this time. So I, I agree with you. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to inject now just to see if there's any, any uh, uh, debris in our filter. And at least angiographically, we don't see any debris. But this is an important step that I want everybody to remember to check your filter before capturing it. And then obviously Elizabeth's going to go ahead and get a pulse for us uh, once we're done. Now, a few, few important aspects on follow-up, and then you and I will do the recap over there, is what, is, uh, we, what we like to do is get an ultrasound. Uh, within the first month just to see the velocities because we know that she's going to have abnormal velocities there. When, when we know that she's going to have abnormal velocities there, we clearly want to know that, okay, well, are these velocities getting worse or not getting worse? Number two, we'd, we'd also like to go ahead and, uh, and uh, you know, put her on maximal medical therapy. And as Dr. Guja went over so nicely, she has been treated with uh, platol and exercise therapy. It's pretty hard to ask people to exercise when they have claudication. But I think, again, that that's where the relationship with the patient comes in very nicely, where, where if you have a good relationship, you let them know how important it is to exercise, and then they, they do. 
So here we're going to go ahead down. We're going to capture this filter. Prakash, what would have been your protocol if there was overflow in that filter? That's a great question. And, and you know, you and I have done a lot of cases where the filter has overflown and, or, or has gotten full. And our protocol is to go, is to go with a multi-purpose catheter uh, inside, inside, inside the, uh, the, uh, the uh, filter itself. So I know there are two techniques. I know one technique that you like to employ is to use another wire side by side, place the wire inside the filter and then suck out. The other wire is to put the multi-purpose catheter into the, over the filter wire, take it all the way down. Now as far as how to suck, what we do is we use, we use the distal, uh, uh, the, the connection port of the, uh, the, 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 the coronary aspiration catheter uh, for acute MIs, which has the dual syringes, which we'll demonstrate one of these days when, when we have those kind of cases. So, 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 you know, that, and then once we aspirate that, it works. I want everybody to know that if you distally embolize, you've embolized a mixture of both clot and plaque and calcium. So most of the time, this stuff has to be aspirated out, that analytic therapy necessarily does not work. So again, pre prevention is the key, and that's where the filter really works quite well in, in, uh, in preventing these things from occurring. So you can see the, the, the distal injection after we're done is quite acceptable. You have wonderful three vessel runoff into the foot, and Elizabeth's gonna go ahead and get a pulse, and I think we're pretty much done. Is the filter out? I'm sorry? Is the filter out? Filter's out. We don't have any debris in the filter, Dr. Wally. Okay. So, so yep, yep. I mean, you know, listen, it's not like every time you put a filter in, you're going to get debris, but it's going to be the one where your algorithm works when you have a, a difficult case, and it's going to be more preventive. Okay, take a foot shot, please. So, again, um, I'm just going to pre present a little recap here while Karthik finishes up, um, and I'm just going to go over the, the, the learning points, okay? So, so two things. No, okay, three things. One, in dealing with, uh, with CTOs and calcific lesions. One, have your goals of therapy available. Know what your goals are. So am I treating a, uh, treating a critical limb? Am I treating a claudicate? Am I treating uh, rest pain? Whatever that may be. Number two is obviously prepare, prepare your, your sheath and everything based on the therapy that you anticipate. We went with a seven French here because we were easily able to go ahead and, um, and uh, use any device that we wanted. The rest of it, I will tell you inside one, w once we get with Dr. Wiley and we talk. So we'll see you later. I hope this, uh, this case was useful and we'll go with the recap in a second. Good job, Prakash. Thank you again. Thank you, guys. All right. So we go there now?